Well, hello and welcome to the podcast from the Huffines Institute for Sports Medicine and Human Performance. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Lightfoot, and it's been a while since we've been here, but you know, there's a really important study that's just come out and, and or that we've just become aware of that I, we wanted to share with uh, our podcast audience. It falls right in line with all we talk about, about sports medicine, human performance, and the effect of exercise on health in particular, especially what we've been talking about the last 18 months with COVID and the pandemic. Our very special guest today is uh, someone we've had on the podcast before, maybe in a little bit different form. Uh, We have Dr. Robert Salas with us today. Um, uh, Bob, welcome to the podcast today. Thanks, Tim. Pleasure to be here. And we are so glad to have you uh, have you back. Uh, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about you before we get rolling here. Uh, you may remember that Dr. Salas has been on our podcast before. He was actually one of our speakers at the Hilliard Discussion 3 way back in 2014 is when we put up his podcast. You can still go check it out on our website. But we're really excited to have Bob with us today. Uh, again, a distinguished scholar and clinician. In, in our field, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. He is currently the director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship at Kaiser Permanente Medical Center. He's a clinical professor of family medicine at the University of California Riverside School of Medicine. He's the chief medical office, officer, excuse me, the chief medical officer for the Los Angeles Football Club, and is uh, in America we call that soccer. Um, he is, uh, and how he and I got to know each other very well, is he's the former president of the American College of Sports Medicine and really was the driver and uh, the developer of this concept that we talk a lot about called exercise is medicine. He is uh, another area that we have, uh, I've interacted with Bob in is he's the director of the Ironman World Championship Medical uh, conference and the subsequent coverage of the race as well in Hawaii. It's a great gig if you can get it. <laughs> he is uh, he's a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy and he was an intercollegiate basketball player there. And uh, more importantly, he got his medical degree from here at Texas A&M University in 1987. As a scholar, he's got a whole bunch of publications and many awards. And as I said earlier, including he was one of our Hilliard Discussion 3 speakers in 2014. Now, as I said, we've done many podcasts about COVID uh, over the last 18 months, including many that pertain to exercise. Um, Just to set this up, Dr. Salas uh, published a paper in uh, April of this year that we will make available on our website that regards how exercise can help diminish the impact of COVID. Uh, in fact, and I w- I'm going to um, steal a little bit of, of Dr. Salas's thunder here, I want to read the conclusion, the one very powerful conclusion of this study was that, in fact, the conclusion was that short of vaccination and following public health safety guidelines, engaging in regular physical activity may be the single most important action individuals can take to prevent severe COVID-19 and its complications, including death. Now, that's an amazing conclusion, Bob, and I want to really start this whole conversation with the audience to talk about how you came to this conclusion. This is not just something that you thought about and then decided to write up as an opinion. This was based on real science and data and experiments and, and data collection. So start with how you guys got this data and how big the data set was. Yeah, well, I think, uh, Tim, we're, we're pretty unique at Kaiser Permanente that we have a use an exercise vital sign that we record on every patient at every outpatient visit. We've been using it since 2009. And the vital sign basically consists of two questions that are asked by the medical assistant as they're rooming the patient, as they take their blood pressure, their pulse, they measure their height and weight. They ask them two questions about their physical activity level. The first is, on average, how many days a week Do you do moderate or greater physical activity, the equivalent of a brisk walk? And the medical system will click zero through seven based on the patient's response. The follow-on question then is on those days, on average, how many minutes do you typically exercise at this level? They click 10, 20, 30, 40, so on, depending on the patient's response. The computer then multiplies those two responses together to give minutes per week of self-reported exercise. And obviously our goal is to get our patients to be meeting the US physical activity guidelines of 150 minutes or more of moderate uh, or greater physical activity. And so we- I'm gonna interrupt. So you think about that, that's only 30 minutes a day for five days days a week. 
typical way you slice it 30 minutes, five days a week, but knowing that really no matter how much you, do, you slice that up, the benefits appear equivalent in terms, and we've got great data that meeting those guidelines really gives a big leg up and probably the single most important thing you could do for your health. Wow. So, so you have this, this great data, and, and again, I'm not sure m many people, um, other uh, clinical populations we have that kind of data on, but then you took, so, it, so at the beginning of this project, you then took and, and figured out how many of those patients you had, I believe, was it six months of that data? Yeah, on? well, we actually started since kind of the beginning of, of the pandemic, so we looked at those who had a COVID diagnosis between January 1st, 2020, and October 21st of 2020. So we, we had about a, you know, a nine month window there uh, where we recorded, that was the, really the beginnings of the pandemic. This was fairly early on. And um, so we started with, at that time, we've got four and a half million patients in Southern California that we have this data on. And so we, at that time, our COVID numbers, we had 103,337 total COVID patients at the time. So I wanted to look at patients who had been enrolled in Kaiser, where we'd seen them multiple times, at least three times. And we wanted them to have, have been enrolled for at least six months. And we were specifically looking at adults since they were at the biggest risks for severe COVID. And I would define severe COVID as you were sick enough when you got COVID that you were either admitted to the hospital, went into the intensive care unit or died from it. That's how we, that's really the CDC definition of severe COVID. So we, we whittled those down and it, it left us with an analytic cohort of 48,440 COVID patients. You know, and at that time, there was no study that had anywhere near that number of patients. And especially you have to consider that in addition to the exercise data, we have all their health data. This is not like, uh, this is a study done using electronic medical records. And so I got to believe that data collected in a, electronic medical records is probably a little more accurate, a little more truthful than what you'd perhaps find in a typical research study where a research ast assistant is asking patients questions or taking measurements. I, I think the, the standard for medical care is probably a little bit higher. At least I think we can trust that data. Well, and I'd like to point back out to the audience the staggering number of, of subjects that you had in this study. Most exercise studies have nowhere near 48,000, almost 49,000 subjects in it. So this was an amazing database. And again, this is not, this is not just uh, hundreds of subjects. This is, uh, again, right. 49, it's a significant number where we had really accurate clinical outcomes. Yeah. Very objectively measured. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any exercise studies maybe that have that, uh, especially over that short period of time, because you were only looking at, uh, what, about a nine six, months, essentially. Nine, nine months time period. Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. so a very short time period, a huge number of subjects. And uh, we've already told them a little bit about the conclusions. Talk to, you, talk to us a little bit about the, your results, especially as it regards to, um, was exercise uh, participation more important than maybe obesity or l less important or, or yeah what? so it just to sort of whittle down what we did though we actually broke them into three groups those who at least three or more times they're coming in saying i'm really not exercising much at all they were doing less than 10 minutes and we wanted to compare those to the ones who were meeting the physical activity guidelines that consistently came in and said i'm doing 150 minutes or more a week and then there was a middle group that was sort of inconsistently active and right away uh, if, if you if you started if you looked at them um, we saw that those who were meeting guidelines, who were consistently doing 150 minutes a week, were about 70% less likely to be hospitalized and about 80% less likely to die. Well, obviously, this was just sort of the raw, unadjusted data, but then we did a multivariate uh, logistic regression, and we, we looked at all the various CDC risk factors and uh, controlled for all of them. So we could really get the odds ratios of, of, of comparing being sedentary to things like obesity and all that. And it was astounding when we looked at those who were consistently, uh, who, were, who were being said consistently sedentary compared to the consistently active, the sedentary folks were 2.26 times more likely to be admitted to the hospital and almost two and a half times more likely to die. That was just astounding to me how powerful a risk that was. And that is controlling for all of these other risk factors that the CDC lists as uh, putting you at high risk for severe COVID outcomes. If you went and looked at um, things like their BMI, it was interesting that the BMI really didn't become a risk for severe COVID until it was severe, until your BMI was over 40. 
Um, the, the risk factor for those um, was barely significant between 30 and 40. It was 1.12 where uh, for being admitted to the hospital and uh, 0.89, it wasn't a risk at all for dying from COVID, you know, which we see in a lot, you know, sort of this obesity paradox, um, you know, being a little overweight or, you know, in the mild, more mildly obese ranges doesn't really increase these risks of dying from a lot of these chronic diseases. And in fact, when you're really skinny, that may be be more of a risk. But I was astounded. The only things that were bigger risk factors were a history of an organ transplant and being over the age of 60 years old. The older we get, that clearly is the strongest risk factor, the older you are, of for particularly dying from COVID. But in it, by far and away, it was the biggest modifiable risk factor. And what we found interesting as well is that those who were just doing some activity you know, they weren't meeting guidelines, but they were also doing a little more than nothing. There was a protective effect there. In fact, being completely sedentary, you were 1.32 times the odds of dying from COVID as a person who was doing some activity. So we really saw uh, even doing a little bit had some benefit. Now, when you talk about doing some activity or even, even the 150 minutes a week, we're not talking about running marathons every no. week, are we? No, it, it, the question is asked um, is uh, like a brisk walk is the equivalent of what the exercise we're asking about. You're at least doing the pace of a brisk walk. And that's what the physical activity guidelines say. We, we know that those are so well studied and supported by years and years of evidence. I, I think we can feel pretty confident in the benefits of that. So it really wasn't covered in the paper, but what is your thoughts about why exercise has this effect? You know, I, there's a lot of great reasons. You, you know, we certainly know exercise strengthens the cardiovascular system, the, the respiratory system, uh, has a tremendous effect on mental health. Um, and a lot of the things, it, not to mention its effect on the immune system. I mean, we've known for years that those who do regular exercise, your immune system is strengthened. You're less susceptible to infections when you get them. They tend not to be as severe. So there were a lot of great reasons. And I think it's likely to be multifactorial. And if you think about the people who really get severe COVID and die, it's often this, this severe inflammatory reaction that occurs and particularly affecting the lungs, the damage that is done there. And we know that inflammation in general is, is reduced in people who do regular exercise. And so I think there were a lot of ways, a lot of reasons, potential reasons why this is moderated so much by exercise. The other thing that, that, that uh, we may not under, uh, take into account is all of these other CDC risk factors, you know, exercise uh, influences them as well. You know, they improve diabetes control. Uh, they improve lung function in, a, in patients with COPD. They reduce the risk of cancer, of high, they lower blood pressure. Uh, they lower uh, hemoglobin A1C levels. So all of these things, we controlled for those. And we kind of took out the effect that exercise has on those. So I really think the, uh, the effects of it are even more profound than our study suggested. Now, now one of the limitations, uh, I think one of the cautions that you put in your paper was that this paper really isn't what we would call causal. It doesn't show that for sure. Can you expand on that a little bit for the audience? Maybe someone who picks this paper up and goes, well, well wait a minute, they're saying it doesn't cause this stuff. Well, you know, you can't make, you know, we're not, we're not, randomizing and controlling. We're just looking at these associations and, and, and in potential, the association could be in reverse. I mean, you might imagine the situations where those who are sicker are less inclined to exercise. Those who are well and more likely to do well from COVID are maybe more likely to exercise, but we controlled for all the other risks associated with being sedentary. We took that risk out and we still found these strong associations. Uh, it, it would be hard to imagine that the, the effects of this are in reverse in light of all of the other data that we have uh, are surrounding exercise and its health benefits. This just fits perfectly with the stories we've told for virtually every disease. Yeah. And, and, and one of the strengths of your data is that you have at least three time points of measurement of, the, of your subject's exercise routines as well. So it's not something exactly. that started we're, doing. We're, we're looking at those who are consistently doing a pattern of exercise, not you know, and so that that the other limitation would be its self-report, um, the the exercise data that we that's that's used is is self-reported by the patient, asked by a medical assistant. But we've done a, a number of studies on our exercise vital sign, and around the country, people are using these same questions for exercise 
And we've got a bunch of studies to validate the accuracy. I mean, it's, it's reasonably accurate. And, uh, and then there's been some other studies since ours that have come up that have exactly supported what we found with very similar results. Yeah, and, and the exercise data you have, if I recall correctly, that all, uh, those were reported, those results were reported before the pandemic. So yes, you have so, established that exercise pattern in your subjects. Exactly. Before. Leading up, it wasn't the week that they got sick or this was in, that's why we wanted three values leading up to the pandemic. So we could look at the regular exercises compared to the people who were regularly sedentary. Yeah. And the effect was profound. So the, the attention now is on the new variant, uh, and it may be too soon to tell, but as a practicing physician, have you seen anything that, that uh, where your results might be applied to the Omicron variant? I, I got to believe it's going to be exactly the same. It, it appears this Omicron variant is perhaps not as um, virulent. It's not going to make people as sick, and I'm very hopeful that you know this may actually be a good thing if, if it is a uh, a less, you know, a very infectious, but less virulent strain that perhaps it'll give everybody some immunity that perhaps that that's often how these pandemics can end. So I think we're all very hopeful that that's how this is going to turn out. But I got to believe it's, it's, it's going to have similar prevention effects uh, in terms of lowering the severe risk in those who do regular exercise. And I, and I think we're all very frustrated, though, that this message isn't isn't being put out there in a stronger fashion. You know, I, I wish we could get Anthony Fauci and, and some of these other leaders of, uh, in this uh, movement that are always on talking about it. It only seems they only want to talk about pills and procedures. It, it, it's just quite typical of healthcare. They just absolutely poo poo the the real things, the things that really work, you know, eating right and exercising and doing those. Uh, I'm just frustrated that it, based on this data that we've produced and other studies have supported, how can they not be talking about this in every briefing that the CDC does? My God, we can't even get it on the CDC website. The WHO picked it up right away after our study, and they have it on their website that exercise is, is one of the major modifiable risk factors. CDC has is, is yet to put it on their website. I just don't understand it. Well, I know there's one person that listens to this podcast who, when I told them that I was I was talking to you about this study, the first thing they said was, did they measure, do they have anything about eating habits? Did did you guys, have you have any data on eating habits in these folks and whether or not that affected it in conjunction with the exercise? We didn't, the only, only in terms of measuring BMI. Mm. So we had uh, the obesity measures, we were able to control for that. So using BMI as a proxy for eating habits, I think would be a reasonable measure of it. And I tell you, the BMI has no effect until it gets over 40. So people who are walk, you know, with, with less than severe morbid obesity don't have to worry about it. This is not, they're not, they were actually less likely to die from it. Their odds ratio was 0.89. Um, and so I, I think a lot gets made about that. And it just comes back to exercise when you control for these other variables. And too many studies have been done without controlling for exercise. Um, and, and a lot of times the BMI concerns go away when you control for their exercise habits. So the, it's, it's a very uh, interesting observation about how we can't, you can't get traction uh, with this data. And yeah. it's interesting. I mean, uh, one of the individuals you and I both read is Gretchen uh, Reynolds at the New York Times, who writes a lot about right. exercise science and studies, and she did a very nice piece on this in the New York Times. Um, so if any of our listeners have any pull in any of these, yeah. studies, let's, let's I put just, that out. I just wish every adult could hear the message and have it emphasized. And, you know, early on in the pandemic, I think we were all dismayed at how quickly they did away with exercise venues. They closed down tennis courts. They closed down golf courses, hiking trails. I mean, really ridiculous things where we really knew early on that activity done outdoors, and especially if you wore a mask, was really safe. And they just didn't give a thought to it. You know, to me, these are, were critical venues. And, and we know that activity levels plummeted as a result of the shutdown. And very little regard was given for that, the effect of what it had on physical activity and in turn on mental health. And, you know, we just, like a lot of things, so many things in this, it's just not, in retrospect, were so poorly thought out. But yet we continue to make the same mistakes. It's very frustrating. I just don't, I think that every thing we talk about with COVID ought to start with getting your lifestyle in order. That should be the central focus. And these drugs, like always in healthcare, they add this much. It's all about your lifestyle, really, that determines your health and longevity. 
you know, all the healthcare money we spend accounts for about this much of whether or not you're healthy and how long you live. You've got to do it yourself. And I just don't hear that message being being echoed, like like with most diseases. It's sit back and let the healthcare system spend a lot of money on you. That's the typical approach. And, it, and, and that's frustrating. You know, certainly as a family physician, I, I see the flaws in how it just doesn't work. Well, and what you've given us is you've given us the evidence to say, what, however you think about vaccination or drugs or uh, with COVID, if all you have to do is go out and be moderately active and it can reduce your chance of, of uh, sickness and death when it comes to COVID. Exactly, exactly. Exercise is healthy for you. It's medicine. <laughs> I've been trying to tell that people that. <laughs> Assess and prescribe it. You know? Yeah. So, Dr. Salas, we always give our guests an opportunity to give us a take-home message. Um, if the people that are listening to this podcast remember nothing else from this podcast, what's the one thing you'd want them to remember? Well, I think it's a very simple message that exercise is the biggest, uh, your activity level is the biggest modifiable risk factor for severe COVID outcomes. And it doesn't take a lot. Simply, simply walking 30 minutes, five days a week, if you'll consistently do that, you dramatically lower your risk from COVID. Dr. Salas, it's a great take home message. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Tam. I appreciate you having me. Um, you're more than welcome. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to watch or listen to the podcast. Uh, just know we're here to help uh, give you information that will make you healthier. And uh, we hope that uh, until we have another podcast up, that you're all healthy and active. <laughs>